Amen. Would you pray with me? We'll open up God's word together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come into a place of worship and to enter into your presence together in community. We thank you for the opportunity just to open your word, to learn from it and to be transformed by it. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do that in our hearts and our lives even now. Speak here this morning and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, it is that time of year again, right? New year, new you, right? We're all, we're all kind of into that right now. We're hoping to be, a, maybe eat a little healthier, maybe exercise a little bit more. We're setting some goals for ourselves in, in 2020 and, and every sort of uh, gym and exercise equipment company and diet plan is prepared to sell us everything that we need to achieve our goals and the kind of counting on this time of year. Did anybody here get, uh, get your spouse a Peloton bike for Christmas just out of curiosity? Did you, did you guys hear about this, this whole thing that happened? Um, just after, just before Thanksgiving, um, Peloton launched. If Peloton is a stationary bike, it's kind of got a built-in kind of corporate system where you can sign in and be a part of classes and different things. And they launched a commercial entitled The Gift That Gives Back. And throughout the, the commercial, it sort of depicts this husband who has gifted his wife at Christmas um, this stationary bike. And then the the commercial sort of records her capturing all of these moments, kind of creating a video journey, journey of her exercise regimen. But the problem was at times, apparently in the commercial, she looked scared <laughs> or like uncomfortable or nervous. And, and then at the end of the commercial, she sits down with her husband and she shows this, they put the video up on the screen and, and shows her kind of throughout the year being a part of this exercise routine. And then she says to her husband, thank you. I had no idea how much this gift would change me. And then it kind of like fades to black, right? It did not go well. Um, there was like this, this massive uh, pushback on social media and online, um, like different celebrities created kind of like mock versions of the commercial. Other people were just outright angry. Like some people felt like it was not only insensitive, but other people accused it of being sexist and, and even abusive, some people said. And no matter what the reaction was, Right? The reality for Peloton is that in the course of three days, their stock dropped by 15%. A $1.5 billion loss in the value of the company because a commercial didn't go well. Now Peloton responded to, to all of the outrage and says that the commercial had been misinterpreted. But what, whatever the interpretation was, they, we can say somewhat conclusively that this was not the impression that they wanted to leave on people. This is not how they wanted to be represented as a company, as a product. We can imagine that somewhere out there at some ad agency, there are some people looking for work right now, right? <laughs> See, this idea, I want us to keep in mind this idea of, of, of how we represent what does it mean to represent on behalf of someone else? And what is the representation that we ourselves give? Last week, if you were here, uh, Pastor Andrew opened up a, a, a letter that Paul wrote. That's actually his second letter to a church in, in Corinth. And he read a, a small section of this. And I want to return there this morning. Like I said, we're going to begin our, our Psalms series next week, Songs of the Soul. But... Um, but today I want to just focus here on this, this little section of scripture and, and Paul's second letter to Corinthians. This is chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians, beginning in verse 17. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassador as though God were making his appeal through us. 
we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God gave him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now last Sunday or last weekend, Andrew focused kind of on the first half of those verses um, and what it means when Paul describes the church of those of us who, who identify or who've trusted Christ for forgiveness of sin, what does it mean to live as a new creation? And I encourage you, if you weren't here last weekend, go, go back and watch that sermon on your app or um, on the YouTube channel, whatever it is, because I think when Pastor Andrew is describing the implications of being a new creation, when he talks about what it means for the old to be gone and the new to become, you're not only gonna find it encouraging, but I think you will find it inspiring, instructive in, in our own efforts to follow Jesus and our own efforts to, to live as, as new creations. But furthermore, this, this passage that, that Andrew talked about last week, it also talked about this idea of reconciliation. What does it mean to be reconciled to God? What does it mean for God through Jesus Christ to set us back into right relationship with our creator? And see, what Paul does here is he not as only describes this for this, but furthermore, he, he goes on to say that those who have been reconciled to God through Christ have also been given what he calls the ministry of reconciliation. In fact, at the end of verse 19, he says it this way. He says, and he committed to us the message of reconciliation. He committed to us the message of reconciliation. I wanna, I wanna let that, if we can, just sink in for a moment here. Like God has, he has entrusted, that's the word the ESV used, to us the responsibility of, of relaying, of of communicating, of telling others the message of God's love for the world. The message that, that God's love is so great and so unlimited that he would, uh, at his own personal cost, self-sacrifice in order to cover over sin so that we might be in in a right relationship with him. And the means by which other people will hear this news and discover this, primarily his, his plan for that is us. It's you and I. Right? Paul's not writing this to church leaders. He's not writing this to pastors. He's not writing this to a select few. He's writing it to the collective, those who have experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying, this has been entrusted to you. The message that God has reconciled, that he set us back in right relationship with him. This is, this is ours, right? The idea of what does it mean for someone to entrust something to you? Like for example, I, I have been entrusted with with the responsibility of getting our trash cans from the garage to the curb every Wednesday morning. Like that has been entrusted to me. The Greek literally means placed on. Like it has been placed on you. There's ownership and responsibility in this. He's entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. There's expectation. It's, it's on me. It's on you. It's on us together. It's been entrusted to us. I want, us, I want us to feel the, the gravity of, of what Paul writes here because, because it's, it informs how we understand what Paul is, is going to say next. And it informs how we interact with and re relate to the world around us on an everyday, every moment basis. So back now in, in verse 19, at the end of this, he says, he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now there's, there's two questions I wanna kind of explore in our time together this morning. First is I wanna explore what is it, what does it mean when he calls us ambassadors? What, what is the significance of that? What does it mean to be an ambassador? 
And then secondly, I want us to ask ourselves, then what is our message? What, what is the message of reconciliation? How do we articulate that? What does that look like? And I will tell you kind of at the outset here that, that 2 Corinthians 5.20 is one of like my all-time favorite verses. For whatever reason, this imagery that Paul uses has always been something that has challenged me, but also encouraged and inspired me. And it's also been one of those passages that I've loved to, to teach over the years. I used to love to share this with students because I felt like it was so relevant in the context of, of their high schools and their middle schools. But really, it's equally relevant to all of us. So let's explore this first question together. What does it mean to be an ambassador? What does it mean to be an ambassador? I, um, I traveled when I was in high school with my high school basketball team. I went to a, a Christian high school in Dayton, Ohio, and we had the opportunity to do this sports outreach evangelism trip to the country of Albania in the summer of 1993 and 94. And um, this was shortly after communism had fallen. And so we were some of the first Americans to, to enter Albania. And um, we would do these basketball games route. We'd travel around to different cities and play kind of their city's team. And then during halftime and following the game, do these evangelistic meetings and invite people into conversation and, and just try to share the gospel. And, and so many people were just curious. Like it just 40 years of communism had left this sort of just dryness that they were ready to soak it in. They had so many questions. But while we were there, we stayed in this orphanage in the, in the capital city of Albania. And just down the block, like literally within walking distance from us was the newly opened US embassy. Um, and so one of the employees there at the embassy had uh, a high school son who discovered that down the block, there was a whole group of other teenagers that spoke his language. And so he would come down all the time just to hang out with us. He um, would sit and, and do like our Bible studies with us. He just was like glad to be around American teenagers. And one afternoon he invited us at the, at the invitation of his mom to come and um, see the embassy. And I had never seen anything like this. One, in part because Albania was so woefully behind the times. Like you, you would travel from Albania to like Greece or Macedonia and you would feel like you were transported into the future. Like all of a sudden, like they just didn't have the infrastructure, things were a mess. And, and so when you went on the embassy property, it was kind of the same experience. You went on there and it just, it was beautiful and there was green grass and everything was put together. Everything was brand new at the time. But beyond that, his, his mom began to explain what the embassy was and how when we stepped on that, that property, we stepped on U.S. property that carved out of the middle of the capital city of Albania, there was this one little piece of the United States that was there to represent the interests of and the foreign policy of the United States in that country. And that the job of the ambassador there was to speak on behalf of of the president of the foreign policy and they spoke on behalf of someone greater than themselves. See, in Paul's era, an ambassador was different but not all that different. An ambassador was somebody that spoke in the interest of, on behalf of someone greater than themselves. And this is what Paul is calling us to as followers of Jesus, to be an ambassador. There's a, there's a couple implications that I wanna just tee up here for us. The first is when, when Paul calls us ambassadors, he's saying something about our, our citizenship, about where we belong. And this is a point that Paul makes frequently throughout his letters in, in the New Testament. When he is instructing the church, he wants them to understand that your citizenship, our citizenship does not belong to this world. It's not here. That we belong, we're a part of the kingdom of God. That's where our citizenship resides. And so our relationship here is as ambassadors. In fact, when, when Paul's writing in the book of Ephesians, he's talking a, a very similar theme. He's talking about reconciliation. And as he describes what reconciliation is, what it means to live, be restored back to a right relationship with God, he then says this in, in chapter two. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and you're members of his household. In the book of Philippians, he, he says it in no uncertain terms. He says, your citizenship is in heaven. 
So this is important because Paul is grounding our sense of identity and our purpose, our, where we belong. He's saying that is in God's kingdom. Th- this, is, this is who you are. And as such, the, the authority that we operate under, the, the agenda that we seek to advance is his, not ours. He's our king, right? Paul, Paul's not saying that we don't answer to human authorities. We do. In fact, one of the ways in Romans that he tells us that we live to honor our, our heavenly king, the kingdom of God, is to live respectfully in relationship to the authorities that God places over us. But what he's talking about here is, he, well, I want you to make sure where you belong, where your citizenship is. It's, it's, it's in the kingdom of heaven. But the second, the second implication that's really important is that in this term ambassador that Paul uses here is that it, it describes the church's purpose, or as you might think about it, our calling. And it also, I think, describes then the scope of that calling in our lives. So one of the things that that the term ambassador in, incorporates is how we engage with the world around us in the here and now. I think one of the mistakes, I guess we can say, is that sometimes when we think about our citizenship being in the kingdom of heaven or in the kingdom of God is that that has allowed us when misunderstood to kind of adapt sort of a version of escapism, if you will, right? This is not our home. And so while we're here, we'll kind of, we'll sort of get together, we'll protect ourselves, we'll isolate, and we're waiting for the day that, that we go home. That is not what Paul's talking about. That's not what he's describing. What he describes, and he describes an ambassador as engagement. He describes involvement. He describes mission and purpose and being sent out. He does not describe an idea that we're just longing for the day when we're gone. Though, though that's true, we do long for that day. But in the meantime, we've got a job to do. There's, there's purpose in us being here and there's purpose in the people that God has placed in our lives right now. When you think about how Jesus taught the disciples to, to pray in Matthew chapter six, right? One of the things in the middle of the Lord's prayer that he taught us to pray is that, that this kingdom would come and that his will would be done. But how do people experience that? How, do, how does that happen? What is most people's understanding of that? It's, it's us. It's what they see in our lives and in this community. Paul David Tripp, who's a author and a pastor and a writer that, um, which is the same as being an author, apparently. I said that twice, but he does a lot of it. So um, (laughs) he talks about this. He uses the phrase incarnational ambassadorial behavior, which is a mouthful. But when he describes it, I, I, I found it helpful. He describes it this way. He says, an ambassador is always on call, always representing the king. In other words, the work of an ambassador is incarnational. He says their actions, their character, their words embody the king. In the same way, the apostle Paul teaches us that God has called us to function as his incarnational ambassadors. Everything we say and do has importance because of the king we represent. Can I say that one more time? Everything that we say and we do has importance because of the king we represent. So what, what Paul is teaching us is that our lives matter. The way we live our lives, it matters. Every day, our everyday lives, not only does he write this collectively to the whole as the followers of Jesus, as the church, but, but he doesn't leave us an out. He doesn't leave, we don't clock in and clock out of this. We're always on, we're always representing our king, whether or not we recognize it or not. When I was in Ohio just this last week, we went back to see some family and celebrate the new year. And, and um, I was at my mom's house and um, she got a phone call one afternoon. And I could kind of tell by the context of the call that somebody was asking if, if they could stop by. And so she got off the phone and she mentioned that um, Sterling and Carolyn Booth, who is, is my parents' friends from college and also sort of my namesake, were in the area and asked if they could come by and see my mom and see the family. And, and of course, we were happy to do that. And um, I had not seen Sterling and Carolyn since my dad's funeral probably 10 years and, uh, ago, almost. And um, 
And so they came in and it was great to see them. And it was like, it's like kind of surreal for me because it's one of the only times in life where I'm in a place where when somebody says Sterling, they might not be talking to me. Um, and, and I was listening, it was, I was hanging out with my brother and we were kind of goofing around or whatever. And I heard Carolyn say to Sterling, um, who does that remind you of? So she was capturing this interaction with me and my brother and, and she sees these mannerisms and these things that we do and the way that we laugh. And she remembered my dad and she pictured my dad and how he was. And they kind of laugh together. See, that's it. That, that's what we're talking about when we talk about being an ambassador is that people would look at our lives and say, who does, that reminds me of Jesus. That, that, that looks like Jesus. See, my, and, and I want you to hear me on this. My, my desire, my purpose this morning is not to make us feel guilty about moments in our past when we have not represented our king well. If, if you have known me for more than five minutes, you know that there are plenty of times, probably too many to count, when I have not, I have not acted in a way that reflected the values and the, the heart of my king. But, but my desire today is for us collectively to understand and to think about and to recognize our calling and to seize the opportunity that we have right now here in 2020 in this place that God has put us to make our king known, to, to make him evident to the people around us. In fact, it's my prayer for us as a church. It's my prayer for this campus here in this neighborhood and, and the people that God places in our lives that we would be something of an embassy to this neighborhood. That when they would walk on this property that they wouldn't, what they experienced here would not be the same as what they experience everywhere else, but it would be a taste of a different kingdom. That when we would leave these buildings, when we walk out of here, we don't just go back to our everyday routines, but we go as ambassadors in our workplaces and in our homes and in our communities and neighborhoods to represent our king there. One author talked about it as redemptive participation. I love that phrase because it's the vision. It's, it's it, this, this verse when we think about, okay, we've got a whole new year ahead of us. This, this is what we want to be. This is what we want people to experience when, when they interact with us and when they walk on this property. Which leads us then to this second question. What is our message? What is our message? Paul writes as if God was making his appeal through us. What is that appeal? Again, back in, in verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. So now Paul is just going to lay it out here for us. Be reconciled to God. This is the message that we're proclaiming. We, we implore you as those who have experienced you, who know this, be reconciled to God because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Paul now defines the message. He, he, what we hear here when Paul writes is we hear God's heart for the people around us, the people in the world and the people that live right next to us. We hear his heart and the message sounds so familiar to us because it's the very same message that Paul just referred to a few verses earlier. He's saying that has, that, that has reconciled us back to God. He's essentially saying the thing that you experienced, the thing that transformed your life is the message that you now proclaim. In verse 18, he said, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. So he's saying, because you have experienced this, because you have understood this, you've been saved by this, you now have the privilege and the responsibility to tell the world and to tell your neighbor, there's great news. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that, so that we might become the righteousness of God. That, that last phrase there, that we might become the righteousness of God, I've been kind of wrestling with that all week. What, is that, what does that mean? What does it mean to become the righteousness of God? And again, I think, I think Paul here is saying this, he, this is more than a concept that he wants us to understand. 
Rather, I think he's calling the church, we talk about the idea of becoming the righteousness of God, he's talking about the embodiment of what it means to be made right with him. So that you and I would live our lives, we would be these living, breathing, walking, talking descriptions of what it looks like to be restored back by grace into a right relationship with God. That people could see it, that they could see what a relationship with God looks like when it's unhindered by, by guilt from what we've done in the past and from shame of our own sin. When we see that we understand that that has been atoned for and covered by, by his own blood. So I want, I want you to be this walking, talking example of what that looks like. In Romans chapter three, Paul writes this. He says in verse 21, he says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here, verse 24. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul is teaching the church to be the embodiment, a walking picture of what it looks like to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That we might become the righteousness of God. In, in South Africa, when apartheid fell, um, one of the challenges that Nelson Mandela and the leadership faced in, in a new era was, was how to move the country forward. And in a country that was deeply divided, how do, we, how do we collectively move forward? And one of the challenges in that was, what do we do with these ex-apartheid officials who had committed so many crimes against the people? On the one hand, there was groups of people who were demanding justice. And, and that they would be thrown in prison and spend the rest of their lives there. On the other hand, of the pew, there was those who felt like if we did that, all we were doing was, was changing who was in charge and it was just gonna be more conflict and more bloodshed. And so Mandela and his leadership team set something up called the South African Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And, and ex-apartheid officials had the opportunity to receive amnesty for their crimes, but in order to do so, they had to come in front of the commission and they had to verbally and honestly um, own the crimes that they had committed. They had to speak out loud in front of others, this is what I did. And after speaking that out loud, then the commission would say back to them that they've received amnesty, you are forgiven for what you've done. See what, the wisdom in that was that they understood that in order for the country to move forward, it had to be more than just merely sort of a verbal expression that, that they're forgiven. The people had to see it. The, the people had to know what reconciliation looked like. It had to be modeled for them. And so they had people come and say, hey, this is, I have to own what I did. And then have them speak back to them and say, you're forgiven. You're forgiven for what you did. Seeing this, this, this message that has been entrusted to us is the message that has transformed us. And Paul writes, look, this has been committed to us to share with the world that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. We're, we're to be the embodiment, the living, breathing example of what it looks like to be made right with God. So as we think about how we do that and what that looks like in our context, the question that I want, I want to leave you with or I want to, you to, to consider and to ponder as you approach your week and your month and, and what's in front of us is the question, what does it look like for me to represent my king? So when you go to work this week and you're with coworkers at the lunch table, whatever it is, I, the question that I want us to be processing is, okay, what does it look like for me to represent my king here? Students, when you return to the hallways of your schools and you're with your friends and you're by your locker and on your sports team, what does it look like for you to represent your king there? When you find yourself in that situation that's difficult, perhaps painful, maybe unjust, how do you represent your king there? When you're with that person or that group of people that, that maybe is hard to be around or maybe you love being around, 
What does it look like to represent your king there? So this is, this is the question I want us to ask and answer on a regular basis. As we approach 2020, as we continue in this mission and vision of what God sent us out here as a church to do. I want us to be a part of it. I want this to be an embassy and I want us to be ambassadors. And the best way I know to empower that in our lives, to, to speak that most profoundly is when I am aware of and tuned into my own experience of grace. God in his wisdom knew we would need that. And he gave us um, the opportunity in his table to be reminded of his grace provided for us. Because when, when I am living in light of his grace, I'm much better ambassador for that grace. And so this morning, we're gonna conclude our service by taking communion together. And, and as you, um, our ushers come forward to pass out the, the communion elements, you can take both cups. They'll be stacked together. Hold on to that. If you're new with us here, you're invited to participate. Um, the only stipulation that we see in scripture is that you be in a relationship with Jesus. If you're not, if you're here and you're exploring, you're wondering what all this is about, that's absolutely okay. Um, communion for us is, is meant to be a picture and a reminder of grace. And I would, I would love for you just to see that and take that in. Feel free to let the, the plate pass you by this morning. The worship band will come up and they will lead us and then I will return and I will guide us in the receiving of the bread, which is his body given for you, and the cup, which is his blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you again that we have a God who overcame every obstacle and every barrier and sin and death and hell itself in order to reconcile us to him. And Lord, you have entrusted us with that message. So remind us again of the power of your grace. Invite us once again to experience what you have done for us so that we would be as effective as possible in living it out and sharing it with the world around us. Meet us at your table this morning. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.